No. So there is absolutely no evidence of any uh, transitional forms between any species anywhere in the whole chain. Nowhere. Okay. I'm going to ask you to go up to the board as we talk about the uh, Cambrian explosion and what all that means and, uh, and show the folks uh, uh, the problem that that brings to the whole evolutionary situation. Well, the Cambrian explosion is a well-known... Uh, basically, this is a huge grouping of fossils that scientists believe came about hundreds of millions of years ago, but all within a very short period of time. Now, this creates a problem for evolutionists, and even Darwin acknowledged the problem of the Cambrian explosion, because the whole premise of Evolution requires this gradualistic change that he talked about. Now, Darwin believed back then that the fossil record would eventually demonstrate how this happened. Because and has it? It'd be, well, there weren't a lot of fossils in Darwin's day. That's right. why he said it. The right. fact of the matter is, today, experts in the field of paleontology say we've found basically all the species we're going to find. In fact, some 99.5% is what they estimate is of the species is what they have found, and they still have not solved the problem. So essentially today we have the fossil record, we have no explanation. No explanation. Now the Cambrian explosion fits much more closely what a designer would do. It fits much more closely, in fact, what the Bible says in terms of all these creatures being designed into the world all at approximately the same time. Okay. Okay, moving on. So we also find a number of hoaxes because a lot of scientists are eager to find these missing links, and especially this ape to human being missing link. So what's happened? We've had things like the Piltdown Man. In 1912, this was big news. Uh, in, in the 1970s, we found that it was a total hoax, that the teeth were filed, that it was a skull of a human being that was artificially aged, connected to the jaw of, a, of an ape. Total hoax. So we aren't looking for truth here. We're deceiving people on purpose. Deceiving people. That's right. We have the Nebraska man. Someone found a tooth. The next thing you know, what did I say about drawing pictures? <laughs> the next thing you know, you find in museums. Here's an example. A whole person was drawn based on a tooth. Not only the person, his family was drawn <laughs> in this nice little setting. Okay, all based on a tooth. Later we found that tooth was not even from a human being. It was found from an ex ex extinct pig. Again, soft science can draw anything that it wants to try to create this story. Then we have Java Man. Well, Java Man happens to actually be a skull of a human being but about some far distance away, they found a femur from, from an ape. So they tried to make a connection. What they didn't say was later on, they actually had found, it was a gravel pit, by the way, which means there could have been a lot of movement and mixing. They also found in that same region, region the same gravel pit, a full human skull. So, I mean, what's it saying? A lot of stuff was mixed up. The femur didn't go with this part of the Java man skull, they were two different things. So this shows you how it can be misleading. But let's analyze first life. Let's get down to some hard statistics. Now, the simplest form of life, scientists agree, was some form of a very basic cell, a bacterium. Now, we're not talking about a bacterium with a nucleus. We're talking about a simple, very simple cell. But the simplest of all, cells of all have to have at least two components, plus membranes and some things, but it has to have at least a DNA molecule, and it has to have amino acids. So two things are necessary for a cell. Now, let's just take a quick look at a DNA. I think everybody's seen a picture of this spiral ladder. Each of these rungs of a ladder is called a base pair. It's a nucleotide. Okay. Now, this is very important because we're going to talk about some of what is necessary in a minute with these nucleotides. Then we have amino acids, which, of course, are necessary for the proteins, which are the building blocks of uh, all the systems in your body. You need the proteins, which everything from your hair to your fingernails and everything else. 
Okay, we're going to talk about a few problems that are necessary for this random development at a molecular level for that very first cell of life. One of the most basic problems is called chirality. It's a central problem. It's a big sounding word, but it's a very simple concept. Remember, I talked about these base pairs, the rungs of the ladder, the nucleotides. Each one of those has to be the same orientation. It's called left-handed or right-handed. You could think of it as flipping a, a coin that's either heads or tails. Okay. Now, they all, all the DNA base pairs have to be the same. All the amino acid base, uh, you know, amino acid uh, pieces all have to also be the same. Now, the very simplest bacterium that science can conceive of would have 100,000 nucleotides. Think of that. Now, we've never seen one that small. The smallest that science has ever seen is about 500,000. Okay. But they say maybe it could go down to as small as 100,000. Below that, couldn't function. The smallest amino acid that could work would be about 10,000 uh, uh, amino acids. So, we have 100,000 uh, base pairs that would all have to be flipped heads we have 10,000 amino acids that would all have to be flipped tails. So the requirement in a random process would be 100, the, the essential effect of having 110,000 flips of heads in a row. How likely is that? As I mentioned, 100,000 100, minimum DNA base pairs, 10,000 amino acids, and the odds are in, incredibly uh, against that ever happening. And we have another issue here. We have to get life-specific amino acids. The odds of that, I won't go through all the math, but it's one chance in 10 to the 6,021th power. That's a lot of zeros. That's just for the life-specific amino acids. The correct amino acid in the right place. And all these are, I go into great detail in my book, but that has the odds of about one chance in 10 to the 13,000th. Power. So this is also highly unlikely. Okay? The correct genetic material placement. In other words, the right gene has to be in the right place. The odds of that are about one chance in 10 to the 60,000th power. Again, these are all incredibly large numbers. So, bottom line, we can start looking at things like chirality, life-specific amino acids, the correct amino acid in the right place, the correct material, and the correct gene sequencing. And all this together gives us an incredibly unlikely probability that it could even happen. If you add it all together, the statistical possibility is one chance in 10 to the 112,000th power. Now, let me put it in perspective real quickly. What would that be like? That would be like if we were take, to take, if we were to take the entire universe and blow it up. Now, let me start with your body has about 75 trillion atoms in it. That's a lot of atoms. That's a lot of atoms. Now, let's take not only your body but everybody else's body, plus the Earth, plus the Sun, plus Jupiter and the whole solar system, plus the one billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy plus a billion stars in each of a billion galaxies. That's how much stuff is in the universe. Explode it all into atoms and explode all the atoms into subatomic particles. Pick an electron and try to pick a marked electron. Now, you would have more chance of picking that electron by far than all this coming together randomly. By far. That shows you how impossible it is. But it's worse than that. It would be like picking out that electron, not once, but 1,376 times in a row. That's like taking 1,376 universes and picking an electron. And that's what the probability of evolution uh, for that first cell is. And I want to point this out, real important. All that does is get your stuff together. What do you have? You have a dead cell. Right. You still have to put life in that cell. Ralph, I think you've done an incredible job here of describing impossible to us. Folks, we've got to take a break. 
And uh, Ralph's going to come back, and he's going to wrap this up for us and, and just make it clear to you that the more we've learned from science about the complexity of cells, the more we've learned about DNA, the less and less possible evolution is. Until now, it's simply impossible. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Neptune's wonders, fascinating activity. Neptune is an amazing planet that can't be explained by long ages of time. Astronomers were amazed to discover that Neptune is very active, even though it's so far from the sun. Winds can reach 1,300 miles per hour, and the planet actually generates heat. Evolutionists keep looking for some weird scenario to explain Neptune. Unfortunately, many astronomers prefer to keep inventing fables rather than admitting to a creator.